evening. We are live at 7 o'clock. I'm Stone Grissom and welcome to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Now we want to welcome our Long Island and Westchester and Hudson Valley viewers. Tonight we have a doctor from Stony Brook Hospital to help you sort through what's going on with COVID-19 in your community and across the region. And we want to hear from you. So call us at the number at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. All right. Let's get right to it. Joining us tonight is Dr. Sharon Nachman. You may remember her chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook Children's Hospital. Thank you again for joining us. I know that it's a busy time for all of you in your field right now. Now, I, I just gave some numbers and we're all social distancing. You and I are now in remote locations. The last time you were here in the studio, but we're all changing how we do business now. Uh, how would are we doing enough? Uh, how would you say we're doing right now? The public. So I so I think the public is doing a great job. I think people are social distancing. It's certainly nice when I'm driving to work in the morning, I see many fewer cars. When I walk in the hospital, I see many fewer people in the lobby, outside, inside. I think people are really listening to the social distancing and I think it is helping. It's important to remember that we have all ramped up how many hospital beds we have. So there's no issue about hospital crowding or there's not enough space. So there is more than enough hospital beds. And with the ramping up of testing, we will be even smarter at identifying who has COVID, who does not, and most importantly, who hasn't had it yet, but is still at risk. So those risk categories of people who are older, who have some underlying medical issues are still important. They still stand and we still want people to appreciate, be careful around those patients. Okay, let's, let's go straight to the phones. Uh, Bob from East Patchogue, Bob, are you there? Yes, Stone, I'm here. Great. Thanks for calling in, and what's your question? We have two questions. Uh, the first one is basically uh, dealing with statistics and percentages. I've been calculating the numbers all week, and what I've been able to determine is basically the, the death rate of those infected is approximately between one and a half to maybe up to uh, 3%. Seems to be missing in in the equation. No matter where I look, is of all the people that test positive, how many were tested? So you know, for an example, if 500 people were so, tested, so are you as saying positive, is that percentage of people who that we know about that have already been tested, or are you, or are you saying that that may skew the percentages? In other words, if 500 people test positive, how many were tested overall? It was a thousand people. That means fifty percent are positive. What's okay. missing is the total of how many people were tested to arrive at those numbers. Okay, let me let, me let the doctor uh, just give us an overview of the of the percentages right now. All right. So the answer is the data comes in very slowly. Oftentimes, testing and treating those patients that have presumed infection is far ahead of the results of the testing. So I think you won't be able to see the true numbers until we are much more into the epidemic, and more importantly, how we have tested all the patients that are coming in. Right now, you're right that the death rate numbers seem quite low, and that's excellent. The good news is, if you're not sick enough to come into the hospital, we haven't tested you, but more importantly, you weren't sick enough to come in. So you're right, the death rate does appear to be around that one to 2%, which is great news for New Yorkers, and we will see how the epidemic evolves over the next few weeks, especially with increased testing. Okay. And, and doctor, what do you say to people when, when they keep seeing the numbers spike? I know that partially is because there's more tests being done. Uh, what do you say to people who, who might be panicking because they see, just see rising numbers? Well, the answer is, as we've said in the past, is please don't panic. Panicking doesn't help you, and it doesn't help your care providers, and it doesn't help us in the hospitals. If you're sick, or you have been exposed to someone who you knew had COVID and you're sick, please come in and get tested and be evaluated. But sitting at home while you're well and panicking isn't going to help anyone. Okay, uh, let's go back to the phones. Christine from Massapequa. Hi, good evening. Good evening, so, what's your question? Um, good evening, doctor. My question is, is that if someone goes for testing today and tests negative, can they test positive a couple days from now? That's and the answer is that's a great question and incredibly relevant to all the people who are getting tested. And it has you heard Stone talk earlier about social distancing. You could be negative today and be incubating, or you could be negative today 
and get an infection tomorrow, and then next week when I test you, you're positive. So if you're negative, we want you to stay negative, and that means avoiding crowds and close contacts. But if you're positive, for sure, we want you to avoid those crowds because we don't want you to infect someone else. Remember, even people who are well can still be infected and still pass virus to others. Okay, thank you, Christine, for that question. Uh, next uh, caller, Lauren from Hicksville. Lauren? Hi, thank you, doctor, for taking my question. Um, initial reports out of Wuhan and other parts of Asia indicated that the elderly or immunocompromised were the most vulnerable groups. However, during yesterday's speech with the president, Dr. Deborah Birx indicated that otherwise healthy millennials may see a disproportionate number of severe cases. Why is this? So I think there's a lot of factors. And one of the factors that I worry about with millennials is how many of them are vaping or how many of them are smoking cigarettes. And we don't have any data like that from the Chinese population, but certainly looking at the epidemic of vaping in the US as well as in New York and Long Island, I do worry that those millennials who think they are well, who are vaping, are they themselves at higher risk? I think we don't have enough data right now to support that hypothesis but we're thinking about it and we will be following up on that. On the other hand, if you look at the patients that have died across the US, for the most part, they are elderly. And while we don't like to call them immune compromised, they are in fact populations that had other illnesses, such as hypertension, cardiac disease, as well as diabetes. So those populations are still at our highest risk. And I suspect some of the millennials that we're seeing that are sick are doing things that put themselves at risk. That's a great question. Um, next next uh, caller, Marianne from West Hempstead. Marianne, you there? Yeah, hi. hi Thank you, Wood. doctor, for taking uh, my questions. Um, I have, it's a dual question. I have an 88-year-old mother, and I have not seen her since March 1st. And I don't know when's a good time to see her. So she's in isolation, basically. She's getting what she needs because her primary caretaker is my brother who lives in a mother-daughter with her. And I feel that she's losing out on it. So what steps could I take or should I just not see her at all? So I think you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Unfortunately, that means not seeing her. If it's possible, if you can set up FaceTime or Skype, or even using an iPhone for some FaceTime, that would be incredible for you and very reassuring for your parents. We'd like to have everyone maintain social contact, even if they're not able to do it in person. Okay, that, that's a tough situation for a lot of people. I know there are a lot of people in that situation. Uh, let's go to yeah. ne next call, Derek from Deer Park. Derek? Hey, how's it going? Great, what's your question tonight? No, I was just, uh, I had gotten sick about a week ago, five, six days ago, but, um, and like, I, I'm pretty young, I never really get sick, so it, it was weird for me to feel any kind of symptoms, but I, I did go to the local urgent care, and they turned me down because I didn't have a, a, um, a very bad cough or a fever. I think that's kind of stupid because now you know i mean i'm fine now i recovered i had i had a bit of a cough and um some body aches and fatigue i knew i knew something was up so i i definitely just wanted to do my part and go get checked and all they can really say to me was oh uh you know we can't test you unless you meet these two specific things and um they basically just said, yeah, you have an upper respiratory infection, just go home. And I said, well, can I go to work? Or they, and they said, yeah, well, as long as you don't have a fever, you can go to work. I have not actually been to work, but I'm going back tomorrow. I just wanted... Okay, I, Derek, I time, Derek, that's, so that's, that's a tough situation. That. I know that a lot of people probably have that same um, comment and same situation that they've dealt with. Uh, let, me, let me just take this to the doctor and ask you, uh, Dr. Nachman, what is the procedure and what should we be looking for in ourselves as far as symptoms and what should we do if we see if we match whatever criteria it is All right so what we're seeing unfortunately is a mismatch between patients that would like to get tested and testing kits available 
So I think this scenario that you've seen this week or this past week, in two weeks from now, may be quite different with more testing kits and quicker return on those testing kits available. The symptoms that we worry about the most are those patients that have fever and cough, especially a cough that is getting worse or difficulty breathing. Those are the symptoms for which we definitely test. And unfortunately, those are the symptoms that bring you to the hospital. And I appreciate that you went to the urgent care center and requested testing. And I appreciate that they gave you the answer that was correct at that time. We're not gonna test you because you're not sick enough to come into the hospital. With the governor's mandate now, with only 25% in the workplace, as well as the prior discussion about social distancing, I think you can decide for yourself if you want to go back to work, where are you working, what kind of workplace it is, and how far you're going to be from your next closest neighbors at work. Certainly, working from home would be ideal, and if possible, we'd like you to continue that. Okay, doctor, that's, that's great advice. We should also point out there are some mobile testing centers that are available right now. You do need to call the state call center. That's an 888 number, 888-364-3065, regardless of the county that you are in. So we have all that information on our website, news12.com. We're going to take a real quick break. We're going to have much more expert advice on how to keep you and your family safe from the coronavirus. And remember, we want to hear from you. Call us now with your questions. The number right there at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. Be right back. Welcome back to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Remember, we want to hear from you. Call us now with your questions. The numbers right there at the bottom of your screen, no matter where you are, 516-393. 1800. Let's get back and bring in the uh, doctor, Dr. Nachman. She's the chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook Children's Hospital. She's been uh, giving us expert advice all evening right now. Um, doctor, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, I, I, I was at the grocery store the other day and I still saw people wearing masks and now I'm hearing that doctors are recycling their masks. Uh, can you speak to that? Sure. Not all masks are the same. The masks that you often see in people walking on the street or outside or paper masks, the type the surgeons use before they go operate on a patient. Those masks are only effective for a very short period of time, perhaps a half an hour. So when I see someone wearing the mask and they're outside for an hour or two, we have to recognize it is not a barrier, it's just decoration that they're wearing on their face. The masks, on the other hand, that we are recycling at the hospital, those are N95 masks. Those are a completely different type of mask they can be recycled and they do not pose any risk to the wearer or the patient when they are recycled. Okay. This has to do with supply. With more supply, we won't need to recycle, but if we have a lower supply, they can be recycled and they will be. Okay, uh, let's go back to the phones. Um, Audrey from Hartsdale. Audrey, you there? Yes, I am. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for calling. What's your question? Well, uh, pneumonia, um, it seems to be the reason people are dying from the coronavirus from what I hear. And what I like to know is if we're 50 and older, should we be getting a pneumonia shot to prevent the virus going into pneumonia? Would that help? So that's a great question. And I'm very excited to talk about the pneumonia vaccine. The pneumonia vaccine prevents pneumonia, which is bacterial. We are seeing some patients with the COVID pneumonia getting a secondary bacterial infection. So certainly a vaccine that prevents that would seem like an ideal thing for all of our adults to get. However, even the use of that pneumonia vaccine won't prevent the COVID pneumonia, which is viral. So if you're having a COVID pneumonia and you're at risk for a secondary bacterial pneumonia, certainly anything you can do to prevent it would be great. And that pneumonia vaccine is a wonderful vaccine for children as well as adults. You know. It's the same vaccine we use for all ages. All right, great. Uh, back to the phones. Jay from Huntington Station. Jay, what's your question? Uh, my question is, if coronavirus affects the lower lungs before and after infection, washing hands, feet, and clothes protects the face, not the lungs. Preventive methods. Use of inhalers similar to asthma directly into lungs. Use the vaporizers with medicine, steam, or humidifiers, such as Vicks Vapor Rub, 
garlic bags, necklaces, chicken soup, lower lungs remain infected with coronavirus and with walking pneumonia. So, so Jay, is fibrosis, your... lung treatment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, doctor, I'll let you speak to that. So we are talking about how often we want children and adults to use nebulized medicine versus the meter dose inhaler, where you put the inhaler to your mouth, one and two puffs, and that's all you get. We are suggesting that if families can move away from nebulized medicine to meter dose inhalers, recognizing that's not always possible with all the medicines you have. So if you or your child needs to be on a nebulizer, you should still use it, but use it under the appropriate situations and conditions. Don't do it when there's lots of people in the room or when you have to have the room closed and no one else is there. So if you need to use a nebulizer, please use it, but don't use it when there are other people around. Okay, let's try to squeeze in another question here. Donna from Yorktown Heights. Donna, what's your question? My question is, we've been told if we don't have any underlying health issues, that the risk is low. However, recently in New Jersey, there was a 73-year-old woman who passed, but so did her two 50-year-old children right. who didn't seem to have any underlying issue. And they spoke of the virus maybe mutating. Do we have to be worrying about mutations of the virus now? Doctor? So the virus is not mutating at all. However, 50-year-olds are still at higher risk than younger populations. Certainly 70-year-olds are at much higher risk. Not having any underlying illnesses doesn't mean that your body is not the body of a 50, 60, or 70-year-old. Those are still bodies that have a harder time fighting infection. Okay, and real quickly, uh, doctor, what, what advice would you give patients who have appointments coming up in the future that aren't, aren't emergencies? So the first is don't show up without calling first. Many offices have gone to restricted hours and they're trying to triage who's coming into the office. If this is a well check and there's nothing else going on, they may prefer to put you off now and not have you come to the doctor. If you have a critical appointment that you do need to see the doctor, call ahead because more offices are saying, please call us when you're in the parking lot. Don't come into the office until we tell you it's clear, come in now. That's true for children as well as adults as well as elderly populations. We don't want people sitting around the waiting room. Okay, and again, uh, that state call center number, 888-364-3065, if you want to make an appointment with one of the mobile testing centers. We're going to be right back. You're watching our coronavirus pandemic special report. And welcome back to our coronavirus pandemic special report. Once again, I'm joined by Dr. Nachman. She is the chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook Children's Hospital. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, doctor, let, let me ask you this. We're, we're, we're told to wash our hands because we could get the virus on us, um, but we're sneezing into our elbows and our clothes. How long does the virus live on clothing and can we get it on our shoes if it's on the ground? Can we walk in it and then transport it into our homes? So let's take the last question first. It's going to be awful hard to step into a cloud of virus, keep walking, have it stuck on your shoes and track it into your house. So I don't think we should be concerned about it tracking in our shoes. The question about clothing is quite interesting. And we've been suggesting to people or families who have a care provider coming from the outside of the house that when they come to take care of grandmother or someone else in the house, that they change their clothing and wash their hands and face as an additional protective measure. And if you're in the hospital or at one of the testing sites, you do see that we are totally masked and covered, just protecting ourselves and the people we see from virus. So it is certainly possible it will be on your clothing. It's not going to stay there for a long time. It really needs the right environment. But if you are concerned as part of coming home from work, it would be not a terrible idea for you to change your clothing as well. Okay, doctor, thank you very much for your time. I know you're, uh, as always, you are busy, but uh, very gracious with giving us your expert opinions. That's all the time we have right now. Thank you, the viewers, for watching our coronavirus pandemic special report. I'm Stone Grissom. I'll see you again tomorrow night.